So friends, welcome to this lecture on technology, society and politics. This is our fourth lecture in the series. Today's lecture is titled Technique in Ancient Greece. We know that as part of our discussion on technology and society, a historical background. We have been talking about how technology evolved in human society right from the prehistoric era. So we came to discuss how technology evolved in the prehistoric era. And in the evolution series of this lecture, today we focus on technique in ancient Greece. So friends, technique is essentially oriental. That means technique as we know it today or technology or tools as we know it today in fact originally developed not in the west but in the east we can say the near east technique originated in the civilization located nearby the rivers of Nile, Euphrates, Tigris, Indus Valley. So we can say that technique is essentially oriental, not, not occidental. We can connect technique with the pottery culture, the metallurgy culture, <clears throat> the mummification of dead bodies, the taming of rivers, the farming technique, technique of food storage, even building of pyramids and dams, we will see that there were technique in the Near East. But we look at this, all this technique of the Near East from the perspective of the so-called scientific. I mean, if we look at this, the ancient Near East civilizations and their technique, from the perspective of what we mean by technique today, we will feel that they were they were not technique and they were not aware of technique. Why? Because We find that science in the modern sense didn't grow in the Near East. Scientific mind in the modern sense did not establish in the Near East. Orient, that is the Near East. Egyptian and Mesopotamian civilizations. Orient was more obsessed with the practical that they never proposed general theories about nature. They never proposed abstract theories 
which are the basis of modern science. But friends, it is also necessary in this lecture that we have to point out a serious error in the West, a serious error in the Western civilization or in the Western mind that the Western world thinks the Oriental mind was preoccupied with magic, mysticism, spirituality and the West conclude that people in the Near East had no interest in concrete action or in practical things. They still believe it so. But at the same time, the West thinks that Western mind is oriented towards the know-how and action and they think that they are so much practical. The Western mind think that they are practical societies. Hence the West view that they are more towards technique and they are more towards science. But friends, if you read literature on the evolution of technique, particularly Jacques Ellel and other writers of same caliber, we will find that it was a big misunderstanding in the West, a big error in the West. We know that the East was the cradle of civilization, the cradle of civilization. It was the cradle of all the practical action. And friends, all the primitive techniques, I mean the tool making. A really took shape, not in the Occident, but in the Orient, I mean the Near East. But friends, the Greek people, on the other hand, were the first society, the human society in the world to have a coherent scientific worldview. Their contribution was that they liberated, I mean, the Greek people liberated the scientific worldview from technical activity. They had distinguished between technique and scientific mind. But friends, when we look at the Near East, both scientific activity, I mean the both the scientific worldview and technical activity were the same. be it their pottery culture or mummification of bodies or taming rivers or dams, you will see that scientific mind, say mathematics or some kind of geometry or some kind of physics, physics didn't develop but some kind of rude form of physics and activity were the same for the, the Near East people. But when it comes to the Greek people, they separated scientific activity from scientific worldview. But friends, another thing also happened. One thing is that the Greek people separated scientific activity from scientific worldview. And another thing also happened they separated science from technique. 
they separated science from technique that they evolved science which was different from technique that is they proposed abstract notions about nature friends that means with the emergence of greek civilization there was a big paradigm shift in the human attempt to build technique we know that the paleolithic and neolithic people built technology as an extension of their biological body and that was closely connected to their society their societal needs the technology was connected to their societal needs for them tools satisfy biological necessities metallurgy dam pyramids fishing technique or food storing technique and even mummification were related to what may be called biological survival for them conquest of nature means an attempt to survive and make a good life so they created tools i mean the near east people created tools to conquer the nature just for their survival the tools that the old world familiar with which was which which was familiar to the old world i mean the near east was arguably a creation of their biological necessity friends that created tools out of their biological necessity let us imagine that the tools were related to how uh, were uh, tools were related to how our ancestors brain developed i have told you in the previous lecture about andre liori gurhan andre liori gurhan i hope you remember in my previous lecture he had a path breaking hypothesis what was that that brain developed human brain developed along with the development of tools that is tools were a precondition for the development of human brain it's an intriguing argument it was not brain that created tools instead the development of brain was preceded by a scientific social system or the development of tools since the paleolithic culture human brain might have sophisticated along with how tools developed in the inference it was in the brain it was in the brain but tools preceded development of brain the development of tools were not a result of the development of brain rather the development of brain was a result of the development of tools as tools sophisticated brain began to evolve let us imagine friends for more clarity you want to eat food let us say be the rice we are not supposed to lay rice food on the mud or on the uh, in the water rather we feed or we need some tools where we can eat the rice without being it mixed with the sand or water or any other natural substance so we need some kind of a leveling field where we can lay the rice at least some natural made nature made tools like big leaves plant leaf where we can put rice staple or animal shells we can put it there or some rock pieces where we can put the rice just for eating it that means tools were necessary in the paleolithic world 
imagine or in sorry in the neolithic world rice was invented in the time of neolithic world paleolithic people were meat eaters they never developed rice so imagine friends we want to drink water we need some tools to pick water our hand is not sufficient to uh, take water all the time because water will be dropped out of our fingers gaps between fingers so we need some tools to pick water so that drinking it is becoming easier so tools is necessary here too we can't eat food like dogs their to teeth are in designed to relish the food they eat but our tooth are most of the teeth in human mouth are flat designed to facilitate chewing the teeth in a dog for example are pointed it, it was designed to allow a dog to grab its food and swallow it whole that means stated friends humans certainly needs tools to serve certain foods in a specific way this is just a scenario i am telling you that our brain developed only after tools developed that is our biological specificities required us to create tools so we have enough reasons to think that our ancestors created tools not through heavy uh, abstract thinking it had happened just natural the old world the prehistoric world we can imagine created tools just as an extension of their biological body tools were an attempt to conquer the fellow being they never created tools to conquer other men it wasn't an attempt to attack other people it was just a question of survival instinct tools just gave them survival instinct but friends something all of a sudden happened by the 6th century bc by bc 6th century something all of a sudden happened the rise of the classical era the ancient greek world or what the world called the greek miracle happened the so called neolithic civilization of the egypt and mesopotamia fell into the occident into the hands of the occident i mean the western world all of a sudden around the shores of the aegean sea a greek speaking people originated and they gave birth to a unique civilization as i told you they just originated west of the near eastern civilization that's why they uh, the european part of the world is called the west the west is not just a geographical expression it is an expression of uh, an inheritance of culture tradition science world views so that expression denotes so many things it's not mere i mean a geographical Uh, terminology the west the west is actually a civilization that originated the west of the near eastern civilization that's why we call the europe and other related areas of the world as the west but friends greek civilization derived some of its trait character from egypt and mesopotamia because it was adjacent to the civilization the greek people were uh, in the old world they were adjacent to egypt and mesopotamia
but their civilization and their culture originated in sharp contrast to the near east instead of a centralized kingdom greeks were city states and it was only alexander who unified the entire greek and who unified both the mesopotamia and the uh, greek i mean uh, sorry the egypt he conquered both that uh, you know near eastern civilization before alexander the greeks were city states corinth sparta athens and friends there are two periods in the ancient greek culture from 600 bc to 300 bc it was called the hellenic era you may know alexander sorry socrates plato and aristotle belongs to that era the hellenic era then there comes a hellenistic era that is created by alexander and his conquest of the world that he expanded greek culture greek world view greek science greek literature greek philosophy beyond the agency he has taken it to alexandria he has taken it to persia that the glory of greece went to rest of the world through alexander before that it was confined only to that agency area where socrates plato and aristotle lived but friends science took technique took an unprecedented turn during the hellenic period not hellenistic period during the hellenic period and they developed what may be called natural philosophy that is philosophy about the nature and for them you might remember even political institutions were also natural this is not social man social world is natural and for them natural philosophy was not supported by state i mean knowledge creation of knowledge was not supported by the state or the ruling authority natural philosophy developed as private and friends the greek people developed a series of abstract speculations about nature they proposed abstract speculations about nature and the natural world the hellenic the hellenic greeks developed theory which was absent in the neolithic era the neolithic people never developed theories theory of nature but the greeks developed i mean the hellenic greek developed theory and their theory they call it natural philosophy and this is not simply philosophy not simply about uh, mental abstractions they are theories about how the world look look like that is how the nature looked like that is called natural philosophy or the philosophy of the nature natural philosophy or the philosophy of nature and i told you state did not give patronage to natural philosophy and uh, we know that in the near eastern civilization there were state patronage and scientific institutions existed in the near eastern uh, part of the world i mean in the neolithic world but in ancient greek you can't find any scientific institution of the sort we have seen in neolithic world the pharaohs and the and their engineers the dam builders the mathematics the calendar the astronomy the geometry that they developed 
But in Greece, some informal schools existed, like Lyceum. But Lyceum was a private school, not a public funded school. State did not give patronage to Lyceum. No public supported or public fund funding existed for schools of higher learning in ancient Greece. Nor the state supported libraries, nor the state supported observatories. Ancient Greek states never supported any kind of scientific activity, any kind of production of scientific knowledge. And scientists or the natural philosophers did not receive public employment. They have, they were, they have no jobs. To put it simply, we can say that the scientists of the Greek world were independent operator. They never got any patronage from any kind of social institutions. They pursued knowledge as a matter of personal interest. We know that this is a very important point, friends. Today, all knowledge is uh, produced by uh, governmental support or any other kinds of external support. The so-called great, great uh, scientists, uh, scientist, great, great writers, great, great academics, theoreticians, all we have are funded by public institutions or uh, some other kinds of funding agencies. But in those days, all the knowledge that we used to see in the ancient Greece was not produced by the uh, state. State didn't patronage any kind of knowledge production. That means, friends, natural philosophies in the ancient world might have enough wealth, private wealth, or they might have earned a living as private teachers or doctors or engineers. They might have earned a living because of their skills, because they were not employed by the state. And friends, there were no social role for natural philosophers or scientists there. And you might remember, if you read Plato, for Plato, first best citizen was a ruler, second best citizen was soldiers. And in Plato's scheme, there is no role for doctors, engineers, teachers, scientists, writers. They were all despised. Uh, they were all lesser creatures, according to Plato in his Republic. That means, friends, philosophical dimension of knowledge. That is, philosophy or knowledge was characterized by a detachment from economic needs and social needs. That is, you have to propose technique and the proposition of technique should be detached from practical needs. That was the Greek method. You can propose theories about how to build dams. But in no way you are going to build a dam. You have theories about matter. But you are in no way you are going to make some tools out of your theories of matter. So it was pure knowledge or search for abstract philosophy that characterized ancient Greece. And friends, Plato was famous for that. Plato mocked the idea that one should study geometry or astronomy uh, for your practical needs. Plato, uh, Plato uh, you know, was scornful of such idea that you are, for example, you are studying something just for getting a job that means you are a stupid person. You are studying medicine, you are studying astronomy, you are studying geography, or you are studying political science. And you study this to get a job or to practice it simply for Plato, this, you are the most stupid person in the world. You simply pursue knowledge for no purpose. That was the Greek way of approaching things. He insisted, Plato insisted that Separate the pursuit of na natural knowledge 
we have to separate natural knowledge from the lesser activities of crafts and technology if you build you know metals or metal tools or if you uh, create something out of your craft you know uh, that is a different thing and you have theories about that is a higher thing you should have theory and knowledge about those, those things is good but if you apply that into practical things you are not a good thing i mean you are not going do you are not going to do a good thing but friends this is different from the near eastern civilization all their knowledge was related to how to build tools but in a sense friends we can see that greeks developed science and rationality which miraculously emerged from the dark world of the religion and magic in the neolithic world they developed rationality and science all of a sudden that is around 600 bc and 300 bc so these people nearby the aegean sea all of a sudden developed something called rationality uh, something called science something called scientific observation geometry mathematics music philosophy politics physics chemistry biology botany medicine they had developed so many branches of knowledge all of a sudden between 300 and uh, 600 and 300 bc all these branches of knowledge were all of a sudden created and friends at the same time something already happened in the eastern world particularly in india something really happened i will tell you about what happened at the same time that when these people or uh, you know uh, developed medicine modern medicine or modern modern uh, astronomy modern uh, astrology modern what may be called arithmetic geometry see something really happened in the east particularly in the indian civilization uh, some people had written something some people had done something which we will talk in a, some other lecture what happened in the indian civilization in terms of technology in the same period but we can see that between 300 uh, 600 and 300 bc uh, something uh, miraculously happened uh, people emerged in the in the area nearby agency and began to propose the abstract theories about nature that is really a wonder to historians how all this happened because before that in the near east the egyptian and mesopotamians were just practical thinkers now it seems an interesting question how the greek developed science all of a sudden they developed science and how to make an account of the development of natural philosophy in the ancient greece is intriguing and it is also difficult it's very difficult for us to tell how they developed science because it, uh, complex things are involved and friends it may be impossible for us to reach an understanding of exactly how science developed in the greece or in the hellenic world in in a sense friends greek science did not originate in greece it originated in asia minor on the fertile mediterranean coast of the present day turkey so that's why turkey is a famous country in human history turkey uh, geographically turkey is a very important location in human history because uh, so many things happened around the place called turkey the present day uh, turkey or you might remember constantinople so uh, later before you know it was er er earlier called the asia minor that was a junction between uh, africa asia and uh, europe and greek science originally developed not in greece but in asia minor the present day turkey there is a city called uh, the city of uh, miletus later other cities in the region was formed like ionia and miletus and ionia were science flourished in the 600 bc 
and friends in uh, 7th, uh, 7th century bc i mean 700, 700 bc ionia was center of greek civilization then then there were no athens or sparta or carthage or something like that it was ionia where greek civilization originated and the majority of first natural philosophers i mean pre socratic philosophers originated in ionia all the philosophers who are classified by historians of technology as pre socratic philosophers pre socratic philosophers originated not in greece but technically in ionia and they were called pre socratic philosophers and friends the greek natural philosophy is usually said to have begun with the tales of miletus tales t h a l e s tales of miletus and he lived around 625 bc to 545 bc he was probably a rich man he probably might have traveled to egypt it was uh, historians documented it and he might have learned geometry from the uh, egypt and he introduced he might have introduced geometry to the greek before that greek people did not know geometry or anything and plato reported about tales socrates aristotle reported about tales in their writings thereby we came to know that there was a person called the tales and who went to egypt and learned geometry and introduced it in uh, the greek part of the world and it was said that tales observed nature tales made made claims about nature that he said earth floats on a water like on a water earth floats on a water that was his observation that earth is like a ship uh, on uh, on a sea it is located in a water body and earthquakes happens because water shakes there are water waves that's why earthquakes uh, in between happens that was his observation and herodotus savagely attacked this notion herodotus the greek historian savagely attacked the tales uh, 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 idea of uh, nature and earth but friends one point is very important that it was tales who started the tradition of observing nature that the greek people began to look at why things are what it seems to be and this sort of a thinking was not there in the neolithic world of the babylonians or the byzantine or the uh, assyrians or the mesopotamians or the persians you can see these kinds of a thinking system that why things appear what it is and he tried to give an explanation that's that's why he said earth floats on a water body it's because of the certain waves that earth is subjected to earthquakes so some interesting observation he proposed uh, it was savagely attacked it was rejected by herodotus uh, some time later uh, but you know friends a tradition was started that observing nature that they started the discovery of nature why nature is what it seems to be and they wanted to objectify and demystify nature they said nature has to be defined in order to be investigated nature has to be defined in order to be investigated so naturalistic explanation present that you have to propose theories about phenomena in question because some
phenomena happens and we are not able to control it and it is there it is there and you have to take it as priori and i hope you remember what is meant by priori that something is there and you don't need proof that is why uh, tales might have said that flood occurs in in nile flood occurs in nile river because there are changes in the wind pattern and wind pattern is a natural phenomenon winds winds are natural phenomenon we you you can't control winds and this when this wind pattern changes a nile sometimes overflows so the uh, the phenomenon overflow of nile was because of certain external factors called winds which are there that is in the nature first we have to assume that that in the nature there are winds which humans cannot change and this wind pattern causes river flows in the nile the same way he was saying that why earthquake earthquake is because earth is a floating on a river like structure in the universe and when there are waves in the water and waves in the water are natural phenomenon it is a first principle it is called first principle later plato calls it form first principle or form in plato's philosophy it it become uh, form the theory of form and waves causes earthquakes and earthquakes are phenomenon so this sort of an explanation began to develop is all but but friends these are all pre socratic thinking then comes the cult of pythagoreans this this people are called milicians milicians then comes what may be called pythagoreans pythagoreans were not in uh, i mean in ionia as i told you i mean uh, it was not located in Miletus, nor Ionia, rather Pythagoreans were located in uh, present-day Italy. They formed a religious-like organization, and there were so many people in that organization, and they had invented certain something, and they had proposed certain theories, and they gave credit all the, the theories, the credit of all their theories went to. not to the individual inventor but to their guru called pythagoras all their inventions they believed that it was because of their guru that's why the credit of all the individual inventions went to pythagoras their guru their master and pythagoras live, uh, lived in 525 bc i think he was born uh, in 525 bc uh, i think he was also a contemporary of sarastra in persia you may remember sir astrian sir pythagoras proposed what may be called mathematics they developed a rude form of arithmetic see arithmetic developed mathematics developed geometry developed which were absent in Uh, in the babylonian astronomy mathematics was absent in babylonian astronomy pythagoras elevated mathematics to a theoretical level and he uh, he, he discovered numbers as a solution to the question raised by milicians about the nature of matter milicians raised question about what is the nature of matter and pythagoras answered to that question by using number system so friends the point is that different different traditions emerged in the greek world you can see 
two other schools of thought like the atomist and the philosophers of change some other uh, schools developed the militians uh, uh, came into scene the pythagoreans came into scene then the atomist and the philosophers of change came atomists believed that the matter is composed of the world is composed of atoms whereas philosophers of change like heraclitus and parmenides two philosophers heraclitus and parmenides parmenides they were called the philosophers of change they started debate heraclitus said that change is perpetual everything flows whereas parmenides countered that nothing changes change is nothing but an illusion we think that there is change but it is an illusion that is what parmenides said so the milesians and the pythagoreans started some tradition the atomist and the philosophers of change started some tradition then comes another school of thought called uh, the hippocratic medical tradition he was born in 425 bc by observation medical prognostication and natural healing he developed uh, natural uh, i mean modern medicine so you can see that during uh, pre socratic era the hippocratic tradition the heraclitian parmenidean tradition the milesian tradition the pythagorean tradition developed but it was friends there was a time called the the age of pure thinking friends before plato there was no pure thinking there was natural philosophy the plato of athens was born in 428 Am I audible, friends? Sir, cut down, Nandi. Cut down, Nandi. Okay, okay. Now audible, friends? Audible. Yes, sir. If there is any problem, please just let me know it. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay friends. You you come to the discussion that you know, uh, Plato, as you know, was a student of Socrates, a fifth century uh, teacher, who did write nothing. He never believed in writing. He never uh, believed in a script. He said uh, writing corrupt our mind, and he was against all kinds of technique. Socrates was against all kinds of technique and technology. And friends, in a sense, all the Greek philosophers were against technique and technology. And Socrates concluded that nothing certain was learned in nature. Nothing certain was learned in nature. There is nothing permanent in nature. rather he focused on human experience and how to lead a good life and plato was his student and plato proposed certain kind of geometry certain kind of astronomy certain kinds of mathematics and friends plato was famous for prior philosophical uh, theories about forms that is forms constitute an unchanging idea reality there is idea reality in the nature we can't change it that is winds in the uh, nature causes change in the water stream of uh, nile river 
water water stream uh, i mean flood is a reflection of wind that is what milesian said tail said and plato said there is one may be called a theory of form and what we see in the natural world is just a reflection of that form so it's a sort of abstract so plato uh, taken natural philosophy to an abstract thinking and he taken has taken science to an abstract thing, thinking and he has taken technique to an abstract thinking and friends then the very the birth of aristotle and before that you know friends uh, plato's astronomy has culminated uh, work of claudius ptolemy of egypt that he proposed some kind of a, a geocentric theory uh, solar system i hope you remember uh, the ptolemaic theory of you know Uh, astronomy and all these pre-socratic and platonic and neo-platonic writings about nature astronomy everything culminated in an atomic tradition uh, finally uh, said that you know earth is the center of the world and all objects revolve around earth that's called atomic astronomy and that culminated it there and later this was questioned in 14th century by uh, you might remember what was his name uh, copernicus who proposed the heliocentric theory of uh, you know world and friends what happened is that aristotle was born and his birth was a watershed in the history of the entire science past lost philosophy cosmology psychology natural history anatomy metaphysics ethics aesthetics nothing remained beyond his interest and he represented the culmination of hellenic en uh, enlightenment the lyceum he founded did not get any kind of support from the state it was located outside the uh, athens i mean in the outskirts of athens and he made a distinction between theoretical and practical knowledge these people were all uh, pure theoreticians they were not interested in uh, practical things and he studied theory of motion he uh, developed what may be called a, a, a theory of matter which later became the base of physics he even had animals which became the basis of botany uh, many modern science in fact begin, begins from aristotle friends but aristotle had a distinction what was that aristotle believed that all knowledge should come from sense we have five senses and all knowledge should come from our senses friends that was in fact a reaction against the pythagoreans or the platonians that was a reaction or attack against what the pythagoreans said about the world or the plato's platonians said about the world that aristotle said all theories all knowledge all laws about the world should come from experience from senses so he was uh, said to be the first empirical uh, scientist so his ideas friends tremendously influenced observation in biology taxonomy and so many other field and in a sense you know friends uh, his influence extended beyond uh, his time Uh, into the late antiquity uh, islam and europe in middle ages his uh, writings influence the writings and his philosophy and the experiments of the middle ages including the christian era 
uh, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, or these writers, uh, I mean the writers from uh, theologians from Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, uh, tried to connect theology with Aristotle. Because a Christian worldview or a Judaic worldview or an Islamic worldview was questioned. Because what Islam said, what Christians said, what Judaism said uh, seemed to be irrational as time progress, as knowledge progress. Therefore, theologians, later theologians have tried to interpret the world from a theological point of view using Aristotle's methods. So he is uh, he he's a legend in the history of the uh, Western world. Uh, his influence is so profound, uh, friends. And you see, uh, in a sense, we can say that science in the ancient Greece was different from those in the bureaucratic kingdoms of uh, Neolithic world. In the ancient Greece, to put it simply, in the ancient Greece, material needs were looked with contempt. Plato rejected any compromise with application. He put forward scientific research in a contemplative level, not in application level. It's a very intriguing why the Greek had this attitude towards technique that you can propose theories but should not put into new practice. It's a very interesting question, friends, but there is no clear answers. Uh, but it's, it was said that the Greek people were suspicious of technical activity because they, they believed that technical activity represented an aspect of brute, brute force in human mind. Man doesn't need so much technical equipment, the Greek believed. Here we find a supreme Greek virtue that self-control. Man has to learn how to self-control. So they rejected technique but preferred abstract contemplation. Self-mastery, you should be able to control yourself, you should be able to control your senses, thereby you can control your biological necessity, you can control matter. In Greece, a conscious effort was made to economize needs and to reduce the sphere of influence of technique in our life. You should not allow technique to influence, that is what Greeks believed. And no one there tried to apply scientific technique into practice. They tried to balance between scientific activity and scientific contemplation. So in a sense they fiercely resist, uh, resisted unrestrained, uh, unrestrained commitment to building technique or tools because they were afraid of the potentialities of tools. They believed that technique has all the potential to conquer humans. This really happens friends. Look at the modern technologies. What the Greek believed about technology has really happened in our day. That they had in their time contemplated that technique will conquer humans. That's why they never uh, sought to apply their contemplative knowledge into building tools. Now you have data aggregation apps like Uber, Ola, you, which has already enslaved us. We have apps like Facebook, which has conquered our, our mind. Or video streaming platforms like Facebook, which conquered our thought system. The majority of people, you know, are addicted to, you know, porn apps. Your biological features have been, you know, conquered by these kinds of porn apps or internet pornography. So it really happened. Now, 
what the greek predicted really happened now so our civilization began to uh, worship technology which the greeks rejected friends they rejected technology altogether rather they uh, believed in a contemplative uh, technique that's what uh, you know what the greek had done friends and this lecture is ended now the floor is open for discussion friends